Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Parikh, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Asian and Middle Eastern Art at the Worcester Art Museum. For our virtual give I'll be providing a sneak peek into our upcoming exhibition, The Kimono in Print, 300 Years of Japanese Design Opening in October. I hope that you'll come out to see this highly anticipated show generously funded by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, and that you'll consider making a gift to support WAM in its mission in promoting diversity, arts, and culture from around the world. Thank you so much, and the link to donate is below. The Kimono in Print is the first show devoted to examining the kimono as a major source of inspiration and experimentation in Japanese print culture, from the Edo period, which was from 1603 to 1868, to the Meiji period, which was from 1868 to 1912. Print artists during these periods documented ever-evolving trends in fashion, popularized certain styles of dress, and even designed kimono. The show will explore how different artists creatively and actively engaged with the changing idea of the kimono and fashion throughout the history of Japanese woodblock prints. The term kimono, meaning the thing to wear, was first adopted in the mid-19th century. Originally worn by commoners or as an undergarment by the aristocracy, the kimono from the 16th century became the principal item of dress for all classes and both sexes. It is still an enduring symbol of traditional Japanese culture today. Kimono are simple, straight-seamed garments. They're worn wrapped left side over right and secured with a sash called an obi. The length of the garment can be altered by drawing up excess fabric under the obi. And other adjustments can be made to suit the wearer as well, such as pulling back the collar so that the nape of a woman's neck can be more sensuously revealed. The wrap style also allows for ease of movement, which was a useful feature for a culture where many activities are performed while seated on the floor. The kimono is also well suited for Japan's climate, with unlined kimono worn during the humid summers and multi-lined kimono worn during the winters. Kimono are made of single bolts of cloth that are cut into seven straight pieces, two panels extending up the front, over the shoulder, and down the back to create the body, two for the sleeves, two for the overlaps, and a narrow panel for the neckband. This simplicity of construction meant that the kimono could be sewn in the home. In the Edo period, many households, particularly in rural areas, also had their own loom, and a woman's sewing and weaving abilities were considered to be very important. The creation of sumptuous silk kimono, however, required the skills of specialist artisans, the majority of whom were men. Fashion was big business and supported an extensive network that included spinners, weavers, dyers, embroiderers, specialist thread suppliers, stencil makers, and designers. And at the heart of the industry were the drapery stores, the most famous of which was Echigoa in Edo, founded in 1673 by Mitsui Takatoshi. Merchants such as Mitsui not only sold kimono fabric, but also orchestrated the activities of various specialist workshops that were involved in the creation of individually commissioned garments. I think this is one of my favorite objects in the show because it represents the process of choosing kimono designs. Customers, as well as makers and sellers of kimono, would turn to pattern and fashion books known as kisode hinagataban. These contain illustrations of designs and patterns that were usually accompanied by notes on colors. During the Edo period, men lived in the public sphere and were required to wear clothing in compliance with their social status. Women, on the other hand, lived in the private sphere and were comparatively free to select clothing styles based on their own circumstances as long as they did not run counter to their social status. They were able to choose details such as fabric, design, and decoration techniques and they would consult these pattern books for inspiration and place orders for these garments following discussions with clerks at tailor shops or even in their own homes. And I should mention that these books also operated as fashion magazines, and women would collect them as keepsakes and browse them as a pastime. The consumers of such publications were then primarily urban townswomen, but they were also bought and collected by tailors as style books, shown to customers who came to request commission pieces. Kusode Hinegataban were sold in urban bookstores, not unlike fashion magazines today, alongside other printed materials such as illustrated books and novels. These pattern books quickly became a source for other artisans to create other commercial products as well. 
Here, this two-volume book entitled Spirals became an inspiration for not only boldly patterned kimono, but also for objects such as lacquerware, ceramics, and even arms and armor. In the second volume is a depiction of suba, Japanese sword guards. The suba pattern could be used to embellish a kimono, other objects, as well as inform the decoration of a suba itself. Pattern books demonstrate the intersection between kimono and print production, and so do prints, such as this one. This print is one of a series of nine images that show the partnership between kimono producers, merchants, print publishers, and print designers in the promotion and sale of clothing. The woman here models a yukata, a lightweight summer garment made up of various fabrics from different kimono shops throughout Japan, such as crepe sold by Echigoa in Edo, and fabric with medium-sized patterns sold by Demaru in Osaka. The focus of this advertisement is shibori, which refers to the tie-dye technique used on the cloth. It is a bit difficult to see, but the yukata is decorated with a repeating tie-dye pattern of white dots that are meant to resemble hail. In the upper register of the image, we have the crest of the designated kimono shop Matsusakaya, located in Nagoya, contained within the design of the shop's curtain. Matsuzakaya specialized in shibori, and I should mention that it expanded its business to become a successful department store and to this day remains one of the world's oldest running department stores. Before the 1760s, the depiction of the faces of actors and courtesans was generic, with the intricate patterning of the kimono identifying the figures. With kimono, the pattern, through both decoration and color, can identify one's social status, personal identity, and cultural sensitivity. Here, the crest of multiple black circles on the robes identifies this figure as Sawamura Kadenji, who is a star onagata, or a male actor of female roles. In this image, Kudenji is shown as the female character Suyunome from the play Kanto Koroku's up-to-date figure, who goes mad and performs a kyoran, or lunatic dance, before the Tudashu shrine with a bamboo stalk and we can see Kadenji performing the dance here. I should mention that in some instances, the patterns found on kimono can bear general symbolic meaning beyond a person's individual identity. This print also features a generic female figure belonging to the genre within ukeyoi prints known as bijin or beautiful people, but usually it's a reference to beautiful women. The courtesan depicted here, shown with her young female attendant, wears a furizode, or long sleeve kimono, with a striking pattern comprising of peaches of immortality set against a black ground on the sleeves and along the bottom. The robe of the young attendant is decorated with a complementary youthful design of stylized plovers, a type of bird, paired with the motif of evergreen pine, also a symbol of longevity. Normally, courtesans depicted in prints are anonymous, but as with this stunning example, women and their houses are identified. These types of prints often act as advertisements for the house and for the kimono designers. Courtesans on parade were a popular subject in ukeyoe. They commonly depict these women in resplendent finery, often accompanied by their child attendants in matching kimono, either en route to meet a client or for special occasions, as is the case here. And here, they're celebrating sakura, or cherry blossom season. The top-ranking courtesan shown here is Yoyoyama of the Matsubaya, or Pine Needle House. The pattern on her obi sash is an elaborately framed phoenix, and her kimono prominently features a brush painting of bamboo, complete with the seals of the artist who executed it. In this case, it's the actual artist of the print itself, Eizan Kikugawa. It was common to commission artists to paint directly on such lavish kimono, further augmenting their value. Courtesans were not the only females in the pleasure quarters praised for their beauty. Women in other professions, such as geishas and tea house waitresses, were similarly admired. This print is a half-length portrait of Ohisa of the Takashimaya Tea House, who holds a round fan that bears the trademark of that house. That trademark, a conventionalized ivy leaf, can also be found on the neck and shoulders of her beautiful black gauze kimono. The artist Utamaro was known for framing his delicate depictions of women with diaphanous sensuous fabrics, ranging from kimono to even mosquito netting. Achieving surface effects that imitated textiles, in this case the black gauze kimono, was a team effort comprised of Utamaro's own exquisite design with the work of highly skilled block cutters and printers. The challenge of rendering translucent cloth, 
through techniques such as the application of a darker layer of color over a lighter hue, as is the case here, demonstrate the virtuosity of the designer, block cutter, and printer in conveying the tactility in textiles. I should mention that actors who had close affiliations with textile retailers would promote particular motifs as their own signature motifs. The Ichimatsu, a simple checked pattern, was popularized by the 18th century actor Sonagawa Ichimatsu. When Ichimatsu appeared on stage in a costume decorated with the pattern for the play The Young Leaves of Ink-Stained Cherry Blossoms in 1741, it caused a huge sensation. To give you an idea of what it looks like, this print shows Ichimatsu as a wakashu or fashionable male youth for another play. He's holding up an umbrella and wearing a kimono with his distinctive check pattern. The craze surrounding the Ichimatsu pattern extended from his circle of loyal fans to a wider, fashion-conscious townspeople in Edo. Here, a young woman wears a kimono with the Ichimatsu check pattern as she returns from a public bathhouse. As stated earlier, the simplicity of construction meant that the kimono could be sewn in the home. In the Edo period, many households, particularly those in rural areas, had their own looms, and a woman's sewing and weaving abilities were considered to be very important. What I love about this exhibition is that it not only highlights the splendor of the kimono through famous courtesans and actors, but it also highlights them through charming domestic scenes, the showing Japan's traditional dress through different customs, lifestyles, and circumstances. Here, three housewives tidy up their OB sashes. I particularly love the graceful figure on the far left who holds up her gauze OB to inspect the progress of her repair. What is so fantastic about this print by Utamaro is that it shows off many types of textiles, textile patterns, and techniques. For example, the red obi being folded by the two women is decorated with a geometric hemp leaf pattern using the pointillist tie-dyeing technique known as kanoko shibori. Before I conclude, I want to briefly talk about a popular decorative technique for kimono, dyeing. Most of the dyes used to color Japanese textiles and many of the techniques used to apply them have a history that dates back to the 8th century. However, it was not until the Edo period that sophisticated dye designs for which Japan is famous, fully developed. Dyeing is a very specialized skill and the top dye houses carefully guarded their secrets. Kyoto was the dye center of Japan, but no village was without its own dye house. One of the most popular forms of dyeing that I've mentioned several times is known as shibori. It is a resist dyeing method that involves the binding, stitching, folding, or clamping of the cloth prior to the immersion in the dye the color thus not penetrating the protected areas. In one of the most distinctive Japanese techniques, Kinoko Shibori, mentioned earlier, closely placed circles in diagonal rows or shapes, as seen here and in the previous print, are bound tightly with thread before dyeing. In this gorgeous print, the figure wears a kimono with a cross-hatch design, which is executed through stencil dyeing known as katazome. The technique involves applying rice paste through a stencil onto a cloth. The stencil is then removed and placed on the next section of the fabric and the process is then repeated. When the cloth is dyed the desired color, it does not penetrate the areas covered with the paste, which is then washed away when the dye is dry. I hope that you enjoyed this little teaser. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope that you'll consider giving a gift to Wham before midnight tonight. Your support will go to a wide variety of museum programming and so much more. Donors who make a gift by 5 p.m. will be invited to a virtual cocktail party and presentation with Aaron Corrales Diaz, our assistant curator of American art, at 5 p.m. tonight. Donors who make a gift of 2,500 and over by 6 p.m. will be invited to a virtual cocktail party and presentation with Matthias Vashak, the Jean and Miles McDonough director, and special guests Emily Rao Pulitzer, former curator, MoMA board member, and founder of the Pulitzer Arts Foundation by 6.30 p.m. tonight. Thank you so much for your support. And once again, I would like to thank the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation for all of their generous support with Kimono and Print, 300 Years of Japanese Design. Thank you so much.